Coming to you from Tony's Pool Room, this is the Snap No Tap Podcast. I'm Joe Cardinal. And I'm Tony Cicchini from the Pool Room. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Hey, we are missing Nico, and we got a message <clears throat> about a half hour before we were recording that he is having a problem with his computer, and Joe texted him, um, so he may, if he can get it resolved, He'll pop in. And the other caveat today is Joe is on call for work. So Joe may end up popping out of this for a bit. And you may be just stuck with me, but um, that's okay. And for those of you who remember how I used to do the everyday uh, Facebook posts, well, I'm going to try to do a technique straight uh, uh, thing once a week by myself uh, and attempt to uh, upload it uh, to YouTube as Joe is doing. Well, Joe is actually doing it. And we'll just link it from Facebook. Um, so that's what we, we have on, uh, uh, in store. So how was your week, Mr. Cardinal? Well, semi-productive. I actually got back into the gym a couple times. Uh, it's been kind of interesting because when this whole lockdown COVID thing started, I was really good at working out. You know, I was taking advantage of the extra time of not having to commute at work. So I'd work out, do some, you know, shadow boxing, shadow wrestling, calisthenics in my basement, you know, because I figured I better take advantage of this, right? You know, like in my mind, oh, this might only last a few weeks, you know, <laughs> but um <laughs> Uh, it's funny as time went on, I actually, I've gone through phases. So I'd, I'd say for the first couple of months, I was really strict about practicing techniques, taking advantage of the times, but I, you know, I eventually kind of got out of the routine. And so, um, but now gyms have opened up a little bit now. So there's one by me, I was actually able to do a little bit of lifting, just some light lifting. Um, and they actually have a row of heavy bags. It's not a fight gym, you know, it's just a normal, um, you know, workout gym. Uh, but they have some heavy bags, so I was able to get in there and do some striking, which was pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, I was happy about that. I also got out uh, on my bike yesterday, rode for about 50 minutes, so I'm trying to get my conditioning back up. So I just keep trying to be like, build the foundation so that when, you know, when we get through this, I can get back into training like, you know, I haven't missed a beat. That's my hope. Yeah, good. I have not actually gone back to the gym yet because, as I said last week, this I have to be concerned about catching something and giving it to my mother with this COVID, and the people out here just don't take it seriously enough. Although all the stores, uh, uh, like Walmarts and uh, Home Depot and all of them, you have to wear a mask to go in. The way the gym is, you have to wear a mask to get into the gym, but then you can take the mask off. So it's kind of you know, pointless. So in essence, uh, you know, it, it's whatever. Um, I'll get back to lifting. Uh, who knows? We'll see what happens. Uh, things are changing here with my mother's uh, care. Uh, and so it's been a stressful uh, since Thursday till, you know, today so far. And then um, she'll be back tomorrow in the adult daycare, finally, which is uh, the nurses all think that's great. Um, my mom now was kind of getting attached to this caretaker that she had. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the adult daycare will be five days a week now, as opposed to per previous, it was three, but because her situation is deteriorated and, uh, that'll be, uh, I think good for her because she'll be around people her age and she can do her dancing or singing or their, their games that they play and just the camaraderie, just the, 
you know, I know for, for me being out here, being alone, you know, isolated, it's driving me nuts. So I think that's a benefit. Um, but yeah, uh, everything is cool. Uh, I've been doing stuff around here, around, around the house. And tomorrow I have to help, uh, again, I have to help a buddy of mine move, um, or not him, but his girlfriend is moving in. So I actually have to help her move. Um, it's the last day, you know, she's got to be out of her apartment by tomorrow. And, uh, so that's that that's for me. Um, so yeah, we kind of miss Nico here. I wish Nico, uh, could, could join us. Uh, any word from him? No, I haven't heard anything yet. So, um, you know, though that might be inevitable from week to week, one or two of us, you know, we might not, I think the cast may change from week to week, depending what's, what's in everybody's schedule. So Did he that's unfortunate. Back? Did he text you back? No, let me check here real quick. Um, I don't think so though. We'll take a check. Oh, you know, I think so. Hold on a second. I'm going to try and send him something to get him in on this. Well, and let me talk while you're doing that. So uh, we're using Zoom currently. And the problem with Zoom right now, it's a national thing, I guess. They're not saving these files, video files as high definition files. I believe because so many people are using Zoom because they're working from home that they're sen sending these files uh, in, uh, you know, poor resolution. So I'll apologize for the video quality. If Zoom doesn't step it up, then we're going to have to look at an alternative um, because, uh, you know, I, I want the video quality to be good. Uh, I know that myself now and uh, Nico are using high definition cameras. 720p is probably the most you're going to get. But um, Joe is still using his webcam that's built in with a laptop. So it's probably not going to be the greatest quality. But if I have the chance this week, I will uh, look into seeing if there's a solution um, for, for the three of us to use where we can actually record in high definition and make it so that it's um, not too technical uh, uh, of, a, of a thing because maybe one of us one day, like Joe just said, somebody may not be here. Maybe, maybe one day I'll miss and it'll be those two guys uh, or vice versa. So somebody else will have to step it up um, but other than that, I hope all you guys that are watching or listening, um, are doing good. Uh, Joe is going to look into this week, putting our MP3 portion of this, the audio only portion on Spotify and iTunes or, or what have you. Um, that was his project. Uh, so I hope that's coming along and, um, so yeah, uh, what's up with Nico? Is he been a, is he going to come in? Well, I sent him the link um, and I just got paged from work. So I'm going to wait to see if Nico can get in on this before I oh, boy. myself, but it's been uh, definitely Murphy's at play today for us. So, well, how can you, you know, the show must go on. I could talk for a little bit. Um, I'm certainly not going to, if I'm by myself, I'm not going to talk for an hour and a half, but uh, is uh, so what did Nico say to you? I mean, is, well, he's going to try, he's going to try with his phone and some other equipment. Um, you know, now I sent him the link. So we'll see, via the text. So we'll see if he jumps in. Hey, I was going to ask you kind of to get on the technical side of things. So when I was working out at the gym, you know, I didn't bring any hand wraps or uh, bag gloves. Um, I was just working bare knuckle on the bags, um, which it's kind of been my habit, you know, because my training, obviously I want to do, you know, I'm not going to compete. I'm looking for self-defense. Do you, do you recommend that? Like if I'm just learning to, to, to punch for the street or self-defense, oh, it looks like Nico's joining in here. This will be good. Let's get him in. He's unaware that you'll have to leave, but you'll come back, right? You'll, yeah. you'll... I wouldn't want to disappoint the audience. So yeah, I'll do everything I can to, uh, Man, you know, that, <laughs> that facha that you had, my God, facha brute. Oof. Well, anyway, I guess I know where you're leading up to. Um, you really should use at least bag gloves or wraps because of the problem with the problem with the heavy bag. Okay, when you're fighting in self-defense, if you're shooting for the face, you know, hitting a guy in the face or maybe a body shot, you you pretty know you pretty you should pretty much know you're going to land on a soft spot. And your hands can be safe. On a heavy bag, the, sh the stuff sets set sometimes, and it becomes, you can hit rock-hard parts, 
Okay. Um, so you really want to be careful, especially of a boxer's fracture. I'm always of the school of thought that, well, I don't believe, you know, in a street fight, it's, it's not going to be automatic that you're going to break your hand. If you are, it's, it's for a valid reason. You're defending yourself. Um, it would suck to do it if you were just training. So you don't have to hit full power. You could just throw softer punches, but you, or just feel the bag, make sure there's no clunk spots. Okay. Cause that will happen. You will find sometimes a hard spot. Um, and you just gradually work into it. Don't start full power when you're going. Throw light punches, light hooks, whatever, and then increase. Um, but, yeah, I think people do overblow this broken hand thing, okay? Um, it, it's not as prevalent as some may make it out to be. But you also have to watch that you don't break your wrist. You know, you can get a spiral fracture or whatever. Um, you can use palm, open palm strikes, heel, palm heel. These are all legitimate moves elbows, forearms, um, even work your headbutt, you know, um, uh, your knees, you know, these are things that, because some gyms, I don't know, some places may like not want you to be kicking, you know, but you can certainly grab the bag and do knees um, and elbows and things like that. If they got the heavy bag, they should be fine with that. Um, I do know other gyms are leery sometimes of kicks because of the shoes, uh, you may have laces or something on there that they think may scratch or actually rip uh, the heavy bag. I've, I've seen uh, owners of gyms like, I don't want anybody kicking here. Or if you do a front kick, you know, and you don't know what you're doing. I mean, that bag can go, whoa, can go far and, and maybe hit somebody that's adjoining. So just be careful. Um, is he getting in? Yeah, it seems like he's connected, but I, like I see his picture, but he's not. He's like only can partially you, in. Can you guys um, hear me? Hey. Oh, there you are. Hey, welcome. Welcome to the hey, broadcast. How, how, does it, how does the audio sound? Does it sound? Well, we're live right now. We're filming, so you sound great. So, um, <laughs> Nico, Joe is going to have to step out because he's got a call. He's on call from work. So, he'll be back. So, it'll be pretty much you and I for most okay. of it, you know. Um, so, yeah, we're not going to. Hey, Joe, do that little, Joe Cardinal, do that little trick with the, uh, uh, share screen that they some people said could could actually activate high definition recording. Why don't you try to do that, Joe? Here goes. Okay. Okay. Right. Now I guess get get out of it. <laughs> there we go. I don't know. We'll see if that triggers the higher recording. Because Nico, I don't want to re rehash it too much because people get bored. But you know, uh, Nico. We may have to switch from Zoom to another software because Zoom just will not record in high quality anymore because too many people are using it. So our video files are not very good. You're, you got a good, I don't even see Nico right now on the uh, screen. Is he still here? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so Nico, your camera's high definition. I'm using a high definition camera now, but we're still not going to know. But anyway, I guess Joe's taking off. So how was your week, Nico? Oh, not too bad, man. I've just been working like 70 hours, so it's been super busy. The weeks are going by like really fast. So yeah, it's... What you told Anything different? Uh, yeah, just stuff with my mom. Um, hopefully, I mean, it's been a very stressful last few days, but uh, maybe starting tomorrow, she's going to go back to the adult daycare five days a week, which will be, sh should, once she gets back in the flow of it, will be good. Um, it's going to... I'm, you know, it's going to be more, you know, a lot more personal responsibility on me now because um, I had the caretaker for like a month and a half, which she kind of took her to the doctors and grocery shopping, which I don't, I'd rather do the shopping anyway. So basically I'll have to it'll be back on me to take her to, to all of our doctor's appointments. And frankly, that's what I need to do. The, I wasn't getting informed of everything that was being said or done. So you now this, this is going to work out. Um, but, you got to drop her off and pick her up from there? No, not from the adult daycare, no, which is great because, you know, they yeah. have a van that comes and picks them up, picks the people up, and then brings them home. Um, that's good. The only negative, I think, is once if she has a doctor's appointment, I think she, she cannot go to the uh, uh, adult daycare at all because I don't think I'm allowed to drop her off. I don't know because once I went to pick her up because I wanted to take her somewhere and they would not allow me to pick her up. 
<clears throat> so I'm assuming there is something with the law. I'll find out though. I can ask them. Um, but anyway, um, so Joe wanted to, well, he's not here now, but cause Joe had some questions about my pool playing. And then we were going to talk a little bit more about training, um, training tips and things. So why don't we just forego the, the pool thing? Cause I don't know what questions Joe had for me, but okay. you got, you, do you have any training questions or whatever? Yeah. I mean, I guess if I think about it, I could come up with a bunch, but well, we don't need a so, book <laughs> My so, anymore. I mean, one, one question I have is, okay, so like I'm out in a really nice area, kind of out in the country, and I feel like I let my guard down when I'm out in these really somewhat what you would consider safe locations. So what, what could somebody do to really stay sharp, um, like mentally? You're hundred percent right. That that's a point that I've mentioned to people many, many times. Um, you, you, you have to, it, well, first and foremost, this is another reason why I like to go back to the city as often as I can to get in that, you know, that vibe. Okay. And you get, you, you know, you, you sense it and you can see it and you, and you look around and things stimulate your, your mind. Like you could see, let's say a boarded up uh, a window or graffiti, and it kind of triggers things. In lieu of that, you, you have to keep your awareness up. Um, not to sound paranoid, but yeah, you ha like when you're walking around, you have to make sure you, you, you look all around you. Um, when you're in stores, you have to assess people. Look, and, and frankly, nowadays, uh, at least here in Illinois and the area around here, a lot of people are have weapons more so than probably for sure 10 years ago, even in the city with these concealed carries and, and things like that. I know some communities have open carry. I don't believe we have that in Illinois, but we have concealed carry. So, you know, you have to start looking at people, see if you can you know, maybe notice a, a pistol. Um, some guys that I know when they conceal carry, they want it completely concealed. Others, they, they want to conceal it by law, but they don't want it to be concealed, so, so to speak. So you'll see a bulge or something because they kind of want people to know, hey, I'm packing. So I do this. I do my, my same routines that I did in the city, um, meaning I park in a certain spot, you know, in relation, um, you know, to the door. Uh, and, you know, I do things like that to keep – um, to keep my mind fresh. And when I'm in a location, I, uh, I act out here as if I'm in a danger zone. I watch who comes in. Um, I, I look for alternate exits. I look for things that may be used as improvised weapons, both for myself or for um, the bad guy. Uh, this is really important. You know, you just, you can do this, Nico, you know, it's just like, you know, if you have training problems, you know, if you can't tr train at your gym for some reason, well, you train out of your house. Same with us. If you're, if you're living in a nicer area, um, it's only nice until the bad thing happens. Then, then once that happens, it's no different than if you were in, um, you know, Chicago somewhere, you know, or wherever, where, where there may be violence. So how do, how do you get yourself mentally in the state where you can just go savage mode? Well, for me, it's because for me now, I can't say this for anyone else, perhaps, but because of the fact that I have been exposed to violence my whole life growing up, it's all I've ever known. Uh, I, never, I never knew the peace and tranquility. So it's automatic for me. For those who maybe have never... Um, dealt with any sort of violence. I've said this before and I'll say it again. They have to research it. Um, I don't know what they're like. W one of the things could be, and again, depending on where you live, if you can talk to your local police department and see if you can do a public ride along, or if you can just talk to the police and interview them 
and say, hey, you know, tell me some of the violent stuff that you've encountered uh, or that the department has encountered. I would also recommend looking at, uh, this sounds gross, but, you know, autopsy photos of violent crime uh, victims, reading crime reports, uh, just researching as you would if you were uh, a student in college. Um, it's just not something that you can just pretend and, you know, get from a movie. You actually have to do the research if you're not, if you haven't been, you know, purposely exposed um, to it. So I've, like I said, I've been exposed to it. So I, I've, I've seen death. I've seen violence. I know what, you know, what can happen. So um, for me, it's just keeping that, those memories alive. And, um, you know, I had a lot of friends that were either active or retired Chicago police officers. You know, we would talk about, you know, not every day, but you know, every blue moon, we would, you know, talk about what did you uh, encounter now? You know, what happened? What did you see? Da, 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 da. And I knew some paramedics, same thing, you know, talk to them about stuff. Now out here, you don't really get any violence like that. It's very, very, very rare. Um, but yeah, when you're in the city, you get it. So yeah, do some research, man, do some legwork. Um, and even now with the COVID, if, if the police are not you know, going to allow you to do a ride along, which I can understand, uh, you can still do all the research on the internet or go to the library. Uh, you know, talk to your county coroner. You know, th th you'd be surprised at how uh, helpful these, these people are. I mean, especially if you're upfront with this, tell them who you are, what's the reasoning behind it, you know, um, so you don't come off as some kind of a, you know, potential psychopath, you know. Uh, <laughs> Right. Because you never know. Uh, but yeah, just I've said it before and said it again, you know, many times you, you, you have to become immune to the grotesqueness of humanity, you know, uh, like a fireman or a police officer or a medic or a nurse or something, an ER nurse, whatever. They they see things that are perhaps and doctors, naturally, they see things that are, you know, pretty gross. And yet they become at least outwardly quite immune to it and not freak out. And that's what, as a war, as a street warrior, you're going to have to not freak out when, when, when something happens to the opponent or the bad guy or whatever, or, or when it happens to you. So that's what I would highly recommend people to do. Yeah. I told you, I've witnessed that firsthand with um, the medical people. I, I went to EMT school and I had to do volunteer work and I actually had to go to Loretto hospital. I know where that's at. Weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you talk about violence and crazy oh. stuff, yep. um, but yeah, I've seen the nurses there and the doctors are completely expressionless. They they're totally immune to all the chaos that's going on there. It's just, just another day for them. I mean, I seen a guy come in there, multiple gunshot wounds the guy drove himself in there walks in there and he's he screams out he's, like, he's real frantic he's like somebody help me i've been shot and and nobody even came to help him they're just like doing whatever they gotta do and then they're just very calm and they're like okay sir we're gonna find you and all the beds were taken hmm. they're walking this guy around the hospital and it was weird because the guy's wearing a white t-shirt and um, it didn't look like I didn't see any gunshot wounds. And then I see him from the back and the whole shirt was just red, completely red blood. I mean, totally. It looked like it was painted red. Um, so I don't know. That guy was in bad shape, but he actually drove himself there, walked himself into the hospital asking for help. And nobody was in a hurry to help him. It was crazy. I mean, I couldn't even believe what I was seeing. And there was a lot of stuff that night. I mean, it was a weekend night. But yeah, I've witnessed the the, um, the total immunity to the, the violence. People are just completely uh, like don't even acknowledge it really. So well, Stroger Hospital is the same way, but any you know any big city um, would have that. But you know, conversely, in and this is something people should think about in rural communities, farming communities. Their emergency centers probably deal with things 
that the city probably wouldn't. For example, somebody who cuts their hand off or their fingers are chopped off or something like that from an accident, you know, with let's say farming implements or something like that, you know, so it kind of balances out. Naturally, statistically in a big city, you know, you have like Chicago has almost 3 million people, 2.6 million, I believe. And in the general area, you have 9 million. So you're going to find a lot of, a lot of things. Okay. Yeah. And depending on what kind of a point you're trying to make, you're, you're going to see, um, yeah, a lot more violent crime, but you're, you're also going to see, you know, a lot more birth, for example, you know, uh, you know, childbirth. So it's all a numbers game, but um, I was in a hospital once and, oh, well, many times with this one in particular incident and somebody who came to visit, not me, wasn't visiting me, but was just standing outside and got shot, you know, at the hospital in front of the, you know, it's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and it was a girl, you know, on top of it all, a young girl at the time, because I was younger at the time, I was probably 29, I think, or maybe, a, no, I was 30, whatever, it doesn't matter. But, you know, she was a little bit younger than me. Um, so, yeah, you just, you don't know. Um, but, yeah, you, you have to keep your brain active. Sad thing is, a lot of people live, they do these scenario trainings. And I don't want to specifically say any particular style, because I think it's just widespread, but, you know, the, the training, while it may get your heart rate up and it may get your, you know, uh, work on some technique, it just still doesn't emulate real world. And, you know, you, you, you have to do that. And I've said this before, if let's say you're a drinker or, uh, you know, you, you, you smoke pot or whatever it is that you do, you get high a lot or drunk a lot. You need to train when you're like that too, you know, just to see how you're going to react, especially if this is a lifestyle for you. A lot of people, it's, it's a lifestyle. Unfortunately, um, you know, they don't, uh, they, they may train when they're stone cold sober and then they come to find out when they're, when they're tanked, you know, um, wow, I couldn't do what I did or wow, I can't believe, you know, I, it, nothing hurt, you know, whatever you got to find out. Uh, and I used to train the guys outside not every day, but we would do outside training year round uh, in all the elements, um, snow, ice. Well, you'll find out really quickly how grappling, especially when you voluntarily or you don't think it's a bad thing to go to your back. When you're in a snow bank, that could, that could end your life, you know, because you could be smothered there. Um, you know, ice, uh, wow, you try to take a shot, try to kick, try to do, try to do a lot of things on ice. You're going to find out you're going to have a problem. Uh, public transportation. You know, if you're on a metro train or a, or a bus or what have you, uh, you know, it's not going to be like, like the gym. You know, you're not going to have the room to do stuff. So you, you really have to um, train for all of these things or at least have the, the awareness of, of what can go down. Too many people live uh, obliviously. And um, now it's not the time to do that. Uh, not too far from more, you know, about an hour or so away is Kenosha, um, where, you know, all the, all the troubles starting, you know, this past week or so over there. Uh, Kenosha, by no stretch of the imagination, is a large city. I mean, not to me. It's about 100,000 people. Uh, my ex-wife's from there. And, um, you know, so violence is broken out there. Uh, so violence can break out anywhere. It really can. And to think that, no, nope, it won't happen here because it hasn't happened here. Well, that's just, you know, that's just not a good way of, of, of thinking, in my opinion. You, you have to be prepared for the worst and hopefully the best will come out of it. So now I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, as a, as a, you know, you've been in the martial arts, you're pretty much your whole life or fighting or whatever, what we want to call it, um, self-defense and this and that, which I really respect that you came from that environment where you put a premium on self-defense. So we have that kind of mutual uh, brotherhood or bond there. Um, growing up, what was your biggest fear in relation to that? What was your biggest fear that you had? 
growing up? Oh, my biggest fear as far as like violence. Yes. So I think my biggest fear was um, being either shot or jumped with multiple assailants with weapons. So that was that was the scenario that I tried to avoid at all costs. And and I've had I've ran into scenarios with multiple assailants with weapons, and I got out of dodge. So. It's not like something that was far fetched. It was de- definitely the threat of it existed on a daily basis. Well, I wouldn't say a daily basis, but consistently the threat was there. Yeah, that I actually lived through all of that uh, actually at, happening and on more than you know so, on many occasions. But yes, the threat is always there. Or what you know back then, truly it was. It was like a oh happy day if you made it home without any any major uh, incident. So um, I still have those, those thoughts. You know, I still remember those things vividly. <clears throat> and, you know, I guess not to sound corny, but, it, you know, it's to, to people who have always been placid and pacific and never had anything happen to them. They may remember their first kiss or their first date or their first love, and they get all that warm and fuzzy feeling. Well, guys like me, we remember – the first time you got shot, the first time you got jumped by multiple assailants or whatever. We remember all that stuff. And it brings back a different kind of set of emotions. Um, and it just seems like, uh, I don't know, I, it, it's never gone away from me. I've always been involved in situations uh, where, you know, there's trouble. Um, I guess I put myself out there more than others. And I stand up when I see something going down. Uh, so, um, and I'm sure you're the same way. I, I know that you enough to know that if we were out somewhere, or if you were out somewhere and an innocent person was getting in Dutch, you'd probably, I would think you'd, you'd try to come to their aid. So in order to do that, you, you have to be prepared. Um, so that's part of us. We have a, I look at it like we have a responsibility, you know, just as if we were a doctor or you mentioned an EMT or a paramedic and you're out having dinner and somebody's choking on their food or whatever, you know, I, you would think that they would rise to the occasion and lend a helping hand. I think we have in Illinois, the good Samaritan law where they cannot get sued if something happens. Don't quote me on that. I mean, anybody can look it up, but um, that's our thing. I think we have to have that responsibility. Uh, Once you get to an expert level, um, I don't believe that, people who are dabbling in the martial arts or just training briefly, um, you could get yourself in a lot more trouble. But once you reach an expert level, you know, and, and, uh, or at least maybe not even an expert level, but, you know, competent level, you should, you know, you should spring into action. But in order to reach that level, you got to do a lot more training than what you're going to get in the gym. And that's when, you know, I'm talking about researching, as I mentioned earlier, to walk to police, talk to doctors. Um, I remember some, I'm not going to mention names, but I remember, I remember someone years ago who was big into the uh, collie stick and knife and all of that, Screama and whatever, um, Arnie's, all good stuff. And, you know, he was talking, and this really shocked me because he was talking about getting cut and bleeding out and blah, blah, blah. And the funny thing is, this man of all should have known better than that because Um, He had gotten savagely attacked by a dog and I mean, just almost got his arm chewed off and bled like a sieve and he was fine. You know, he didn't die. And, you know, so I think sometimes people think when they're doing certain martial art moves, be it weapons or no weapons that, you know, this is all killer stuff. This is, you know, deadly, deadly, deadly. It's potentially maybe deadly, but you, you have to get a, a basis in reality and and it goes both ways you got to know that what your body can take and what your opponent's body can take and i remember reading many 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 years ago point karate guys who it might even have been bill wallace or somebody like him who made the transition to full contact and whoever the man was and i don't want to attribute this to bill if it wasn't him 
said, uh, yeah, we all thought our punches were deadly. And, you know, that's why we pulled our punches and did no contact. And then, you know, we were kind of misled in a way, because once you started doing full contact, you're, you're clobbering guys and they're coming back at you for more. And you realize, oh boy, there's more to it than what I thought. And, and, and that's just the truth. Um, you know, in life, uh, you know, I've gotten, when I've gotten attacked several times with people who were brandishing weapons, bats and pipes and stuff, well, things did not hurt me as much as I thought they would, you know, in, you know, even, even previously, or even in hindsight, I'm like, damn, until after afterwards, then I started to ache and break, you know, but, um, as your body goes into shock and you have adrenaline and everything, but, um, you know, you just have to be prepared. You know, you really have to, you know, know this. Um, and you can't make any assumptions. You know, you, you need to really talk to experts. And, you know, I've befriended, like I said, doctors and people that are in this world, so to speak, of violence or, you know, whatever. And it's not like the movies. You know, sometimes one shot is enough, like a gunshot is enough to kill you. Other times you can get shot several times and you keep coming, you know? Um, so you got to know this going in um, all the potential scenarios. So you don't just take things lightly or take things for granted and, and also use it as a motivation, you know, use it to know, Hey, my body can probably withstand a little bit more than I may, might be giving a credit, giving credit for. Um, so there's just really no substitution for not, you know, for quality knowledge and for your continuing education. And, um, and that's like a big pet peeve with me. You know, we don't need to rehash it again, but you know, I, I see less and less self-defense uh, training going on, you know, realistic self-defense training. Um, and it's all just seems to be more geared towards sport. And Hey, if that's what the person's into, do it. But I'm, you know, I'm, I want to be here to help the people who are looking more for the self-defense um, aspect of it. That's my take on it. Um, yeah, I think there's, for those of us that are used to training, I think there's a disconnect because it's like we're inside a nice padded room. We're all like playing nice with each other. We're, we're not slamming each other as hard as we can. We're not breaking submissions. Um, we're being gentlemen and we're, you know, we're basically playing a game. So I don't, I mean, how do you get from the point to where you're in a life and death scenario and you got to flip that switch when you're so used to just training with people and taking it easy on them and, you know, not, not doing damage. It's like, it's almost like it's ingrained into your muscle memory where you're not going to just break somebody's arm. If you do an arm bar, I mean, how do you, how do you make that switch? Some people cannot, some people just don't have it in them to make that switch to let's call it, let's call it becoming violent. Let's just use that word. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> some people can't. And I remember years ago when I was still training at the old tool and die shop, the hardcore, and I would have, you know, guys would want to get choked out. They want to know what the sensation's like. And that's good. You know, um, let's just don't, don't do it all the time, but you'd be surprised how many students couldn't choke the guy out purposely. They just felt queasy about making someone uncomfortable or uh, unconscious. And that is a big red flag <clears throat> because if you can't choke someone out safely <clears throat> and gently and kindly and voluntarily, you know, uh, what are you going to do in the real world? Uh, you're, are you going to be able to take that next level? Are, are you going to be able to do that? And now in the news, we hear about people getting shot and this and that. And while I am not here to, to, to put myself into, into the perpetrator's mindset, I just think sometimes when you have a gun or a weapon of, of, of some sort, there's a there's a detachment. You, in a way, kind of seem detached. It's not me doing it. It's the weapon doing it. It's the gun doing it. It's the baseball bat or the whatever doing it. And I think that in itself can open up a psychological can of worms. Um, 
I remember years when I, okay, every time I got jumped and people had weapons, and this may offend some people, and I am not against people training using weapons, but I always remembered, and to this day, I never said, like, let's say the guys had baseball bats. I never said, man, I wish I had a baseball bat. I always said, well, I wish they didn't have any weapons. I'd kick the shit out of them. I always thought that way, weaponless, man on man, one on one. Because when you start thinking in the mindset of weapons, um, you can actually get totally blown out, okay? This can be escalated um, way beyond anything you, you can fathom. And let me explain what I mean by that. If I train as an empty hand guy, I know that when I'm in my peak, when I'm in my best shape, I can fight in my prime, nobody's going to beat me up. It's not going to happen. I have all the strength, speed, knowledge, ability. I could hold my own against anyone. Now, what, let's say I have a weapon. Let's say I have a knife. Now you have a gun. Okay. Let's say I have a baseball bat and a buddy. Well, you have an automobile. <laughs> okay. That can run us down. All right. Well, I have a car where well, you have a pickup truck. It, where does this end? Okay. Um, so when you start talking about weapons, uh, it can just keep on going and going and going. So for me, the first line of attack in your training is to make yourself the ultimate weapon. You have to be the weapon. And it stems not just from your body, but it stems from your mind. And you have to have that mindset saying, I will do whatever it takes to defend myself, my friends, other loved ones, family. And, you know, it's, it's very easy for someone to pick up, let's say, a gun and just start shooting. And they really, maybe they defended someone, but I don't know if they figured it all out upstairs yet, you know, of, of, of what it's like. But for me, seeing violence and seeing people of all ages, gender, race, become victims of violent crime, um, it, it left such a mark on me that I wish I had superhero powers because I would have, you know, eliminated all of this anywhere I could. Um, but yeah, I, I just think I turned the switch because I value other people's lives. I, I don't want things to happen to other people because I care enough. And if I care enough, I would certainly give my life for someone else. Because I, I mentioned this on videos or in audios too. I don't put such a high priority on my own life. I mean, I'm not suicidal, but I'm just saying when the shit hits the fan and I'm in that scenario, I'm going to try to take you out. Okay. I, I, I'm not going to start worrying about what's going to happen to me. What's going to happen if I was married, which I'm not. But if I had a wife and five kids, I'm not going to worry about them right now. I can't. I have to have all of that taken care of long before the fight. Okay. So that when the, when the situation hits the fan, I have a clean slate. And somebody asked me, well, how do you take care of that stuff? Well, you have a life insurance policy, for example, or you, you make sure that your children, if you have them, are enrolled in the proper schools or you left a legacy or, or something, whatever your personal life is. And for each of us, it'll be a little bit different. Um, you have to have business taken care of so that when you do enter into this self-defense scenario, you have to know that this may be the last time I do anything. I may, I may not come out of this. Okay. So you have to make it worth it. Okay. Um, it, it has to be something that's worth dying for. And not only that, um, you don't know, you may not want to engage the guy, but the guy may want to engage you. So you may have no choice but to step it up and, and do it. So what makes me, for me, I mention it again, you know, again, I'll mention it. Turning the switch for me is no problem because it's, Somebody once told me when I'm, when I'm being the nice guy, the regular Tony, that's the switch. <laughs> I turn on the nice switch as opposed <laughs> to people turning on the bad switch. 
Okay. I think maybe I turn on the nice switch every day when I wake up. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, you, you have to have that and some pe- that killer instinct or whatever. Some people just don't have it. Even in competitive sports, some people just don't have it. You know, they just can't go to the next level. Um, and then others are just all talk. They got a big mouth, you know, um, which, you know, you can blow through that in a heartbeat. I know you enough to think that you would step it up. I think you would. I, I would be shocked more if you didn't. Um, so, um, yeah. And I can tell people this from my personal experience. Love can kind of, when you're in love with someone, which I'm not right now, but when I was, I remember one time very vividly when I was, this is many years, this is 20 some years ago with somebody. And I, I, I kind of got the little nerves. I'm like, Oh, I don't want nothing to happen to me now because now I have, I have this woman in my life. And I immediately, I was in an airplane with Kevin. Um, when that happened, we kind of got into some bad weather or whatever, not major. And then I'm like, Oh man, I don't want nothing to happen here because now I have her in my life and I want to get back to seeing her. The minute we landed back at the, at the time at Midway airport, I'm like, Nope, I got to work on this. I cannot let love turn me into a, uh, I can't be concerned about someone else when it comes time to, you know, losing my life. So I worked hard on that. Uh, to make sure that that never happened again. So, so what did you do to work on it? Well, just psychologically. I mean, I just kept thinking, you know, w- with myself, I said, I'm no good. All this training that I had, this, I was really, you know, top condition. And I'm like, all of this training, and I'm going to freeze up if I had to, you know, if I had to use it in real life, I said, I've never, I've never frozen before. I'm going to freeze up now because, because I'm in, because of this woman. And it, it wasn't a shock. I mean, it wasn't an insult on the woman. It's good to love her, but it's, you, you have to love someone with certain conditions. And that is, you know, I, what if, what if somebody attacked her or, or a group? I'm good. I know that I'm going to have to jump in to, def, to defend her life. I would have no problem doing that. So I think that's when the, when the light bulb went off. I'm like, okay, Tony, if you can die to save, to save her, then you should have no problem dying, period. And like I mentioned about taking care of things, uh, I set up in my personal life at that time to, to take care. If something did happen to me, she would have been taken care of at that point in time. Okay, not greatly because I didn't have millions of dollars, you know, but she'd have had a couple thousand, three, four thousand dollars to tie her over or something. You know, I, I, I would have made sure I made sure of that. Thankfully, it never came to that. But um, and we weren't married or anything. It was just a girlfriend, but I just I kind of had feelings at that point. But um, so that's what I did. Now, you or whoever else is listening may for them, it may be a, a different thing, you know, um, everyone's different, but be that as it may, if you don't have the switch, I can't answer that. You need to talk to yourself and to a psychologist and you need to find out what, why don't you have it? Is it because of fear of, uh, of, are you in, insecure? Do you know deep down that your techniques aren't going to bail you out? Uh, do you feel queasy about hurting someone else? Are you a, a pacifist to the, to the extent where you're just going to you know, roll over? Um, these are questions that only that person himself or herself can ask and hopefully can get, get the answers. Um, everyone's different. So I do believe it's important, though, that you dig to that point, dig to that level. And no, um, it's funny. I've been, you know, people have been knowing that, you know, I want to move back to Chicago, da, 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 da. And so many people are like, I mean, I'm talking like well over 10 people, 12, 15 people. Like you want to move back to Chicago? It's so violent. It's so violent. These are fear, fearful people. I don't fear that because I don't make more of it than what it is. It's not like the whole damn town is, is, you know, 
every every street corner there's somebody getting shot you know i think rationally okay and I, and i realize that something can happen to me out here you know just as it, just as it can anywhere you know and i've i've said it before and i'll say it again when you're a victim of a violent situation here when you're not a victim but but you're in a, in a uh, in a violent situation there's no there's no place on planet earth that's deadlier than where you're at right now there's no no place on earth that's more dangerous than where you're at right now because you're potentially staring down death and sadly the majority of violent crimes actually happen in the house there's people who live right now in in violent situations children women even men uh so violence is anywhere, Nico. You know this. You know this as well as I do. And so these people were like, how can you want to move back to Chicago? It's so violent. Da, da, da. They're, they're clueless. It's, it, parts of it are violent. But there's parts of Chicago that aren't. Per capita, it's not the most violent city in America. But all those statistics just really don't matter because violence can happen anywhere. Anywhere that two people can interact you you run the potential of having a violent encounter so you know it's it's a numbers game is what it is so i so what else is up what else do you have to ask so i mean I, <clears throat> just analyzing the some of the self defense arts um if i and i don't know these arts too well but if i analyze for example like krav maga it seems so these arts they all have somewhat of a method of developing you mentally for that type of scenario and aggression and fear response in catch wrestling as well so i kind of wanted to discuss the the differences and, and how they go about that so with with krav maga it seems like they take your fear response they try to turn your fear response into aggression right away um with the the Russian Sistema, which I think is very interesting, they take your fear response and they try to get you to breathe and relax and turn you back into, you know, reacting like you would if you were more relaxed, more fluid. Um, so they breathe into that fear. They use breathing techniques to kind of bring you, bring you back to that normal reaction time and normal stress response. So you don't get that adrenaline dump. And now with catch wrestling, like from training with you, from what I see, it's like you take, you guys use conditioning to stimulate that adrenaline dump and that fear response. And then you put, put, you put us into like bad situations, like, you know, escape scenarios. So like after we're basically almost broken from the conditioning mentally and physically, now we've got to work on escaping a really bad scenario and which I think is very effective. Um, but is, is that basically the method of catch wrestling for self-defense as far as developing you mentally for violence? Well, I'm the only one that teaches it for self-defense to my knowledge, but every school, every system, it, it boils down to the school. Every school yeah. is different. Um, you know, uh, as I said, I'm going off of actual experience and not one fight or two fights, but a lot of street encounters. So I've said it before. I'll say it again. I don't know anybody who's had with as many real world encounters. So I know what's going on. Um, but uh, yeah, any martial art, any school you go to is going to teach it a little bit differently. One from the next, from the next. So I don't like to take any sort of blanket statements. I used to train guys much more severe than I do now because these people that I was training, many of them, not all of them, but many of them couldn't handle it. Okay. Um, and you haven't even touched a search, scratch the surface of the, the more intense stuff, the ripping and everything else and all of the heavy duty physical stuff. Um, you know, because we were, we were just, you know, you had a few lessons and then all of a sudden, boom, here comes the COVID. Um, but you know, so my thing is every instructor is going to bring their personality into the game and you have to make sure that you have your personalities mesh. You know, the theory, the techniques could be great, 
But if the personality isn't there and you can't get along with the instructor or he can't, he can't reach you or you can't reach him intellectually, you're, you're going to have to move on. Um, that goes with me. It goes with anybody. Uh, you know, and that's how I was even with, with music. You know, I, I've, I've studied with music with several people that were damn near better, a lot better players than I was, but I, I was, but their, their uh, teaching methodology or their, personality just I couldn't get anything out of them you know so uh we weren't a blend for me I want your the, the worst beating so to speak that you'll ever take I want you to take it here in the gym so that you know that when you go out in the real world it's going to be a lot easier than than what it is here that's my whole uh that's that's what I'm looking at because that's how I felt when I was learning as bad as my living situation was um, the pain, the fear, the adrenaline, the, the emotions that I felt in training was beyond belief. And I don't know many schools where people feel any emotion when they're training. Okay. Now you mentioned something about one of the systems wants, you know, the aggression. Well, I don't think aggression is the right thing here. You, if it is, it's gotta be very, very controlled. Um, the breathing, the being relaxed, that's, that's good. Uh, but it's much, obviously, it's much easier said than done. Um, yeah. bre breathing is an autonomic thing. Um, it's more than just a mental uh, 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 deal. You know, you, you have to, I mean, no, okay, here, take, for example, 100 meter dash, uh, Usain Bolt, who, by the way, world fastest human, but he also just got COVID. But the minute they're done running that hundred meters, they're, they're breathing like a runaway freight train for a while. Okay. Um, maybe not for 20 minutes, but because you're exerting maximum effort here. Uh, so if you're in a street scenario or any kind of scenario, you know, where you have to give it a maximum effort, you will be, uh, you're not going to be breathing like I'm breathing right now. And therefore, you don't want to start being your own worst enemy. You don't want to start now focusing on, oh, I got to breathe. I got to slow my breathing down. I got to slow. You can't, your mind cannot be distracted on all these other thoughts. Your mind has to be on one thought and one thought only. And that's defending yourself, destroying your opponent, destroying the enemy and defending yourself. Nothing else. Okay. Um, you cannot worry about, I've said this before, you cannot be fighting yourself and your opponent. You just have to fight your opponent. So anytime you are consciously thinking of stuff uh, about yourself, you've already put yourself at a disadvantage. I don't care what style it is. This has to become automatic. Like right now, I'm not thinking of what to say ahead of time. I'm freelancing. I'm just improvising and I'm speaking. Uh, straight. And that's how your fighting has to be. You know, you can't, you just truly cannot be worried about all these other incidentals. Um, and you will have a bunch of emotions going through your mind, either hopefully after the situation is done. Okay. When you can re reflect on things, but um, I believe people tend to especially those who've never really been in a legitimate violent situation, unarmed, all alone, uh, they tend to role play and they uh, fantasize in a way. I don't know if that's the right word, but they, they try to figure, they, they try to extrapolate. I think I would feel like this. Well, you don't know how you would feel until you feel it, until you're actually there for real. And again, all, everyone is different, but it's great when you have an instructor that can tell you firsthand experience. This is what I felt. This is how I handled it and so on. So for me, yeah, it's all about um, trying to have a blank, you know, mental slate and just focus on the task at hand, which is that man that, that you're you know, going up against, you know, um, to me, that's just ideal. Anything else is just 
adding more pressure and you know th 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 that's to me it's just like when you're shooting competitive pool you know like when you're practicing by yourself there's no drama there's no stress you miss you miss all of a sudden if you're playing for the championship you you know you may think oh my goodness I, this is on the line that's on the line blah 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 then you you might fold some people do fold um so you want to take away the pressure of the situation as much as you can and not permanently nico but delay it say i'll worry about this 10 minutes from now or five minutes from now when it's all over okay um i guess the best word to be would to use would to be be oblivious to all the dangers that you're facing just know what you have to do and you know if you're trained properly and you've been exposed to world-class techniques, you'll come out, you'll come out okay. And you mentioned earlier about bailing out, you know, running away or whatever the word was. Yeah, maybe you can engage the guy for an X amount of time and if things just don't seem to be going that way, going your way, get out of Dodge. Because um, we're not always gonna be hitting home runs. You know, some days we may not feel that good or something may, or we may be injured, you know, and, uh, but you still, you should still be able to do the best you can. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, it's the way it is for me, at least it just came automatic. So you pretty much got to be on autopilot. You can't be thinking at all, really. Autopilot. And, oh, you mentioned the word reaction. You know, reaction is a negative word. Um, now, I'm not knocking you, but you mentioned that the, the, the schools teach that. No, you have to be proactive. You have to act, not react, okay? The minute you react, you're giving the opponent the advantage. And your, um, not skills, what is it? Your reflexes and whatnot are going to be slightly diminished compared to his, you know, cause he can, he can come at you quicker than maybe you can re react. So the only time you should, I don't even know if this would be the word react. I would use the word assess. You want to assess the situation. You want to just say, Hey, look, I, this is to yourself. Okay. This, this looks like this is going to be a potentially dangerous situation. And then you have to play the game on, on your terms. I'm, I, I cannot afford to constantly be reacting to you because something is just, you have the advantage. It's like, again, using pool, shooting pool. Um, I don't need you to uh, always break, for example, because you might make the nine, if we're playing nine ball, you might make the nine on the break. Or if you're playing eight ball, you might make the eight ball on the break. Okay. And then I lose. So I'm not going to give you that opportunity in the street um, situation. I'm just not going to do it. Um, I'm going to make you react to me because no matter how bad your intentions are, you just ran into your worst nightmare. You are going to know quickly you made a mistake as the opponent. You made a mistake and you're going to take the will. You need to take their will away just destroy them, not just physically, but destroy them psychologically. And man, um, that can happen and it should happen. And with proper training, it, it will happen for sure. It seems like um, that methodology is ingrained in, in catch wrestling because for me, like if I analyze BJJ as opposed to catch wrestling, BJJ, it's more what I would consider defensive in kind of making your opponent make a mistake and then capitalizing on it. Whereas in catch wrestling, it seems more like more aggressive, more of like you are using pain to cause reactions and then capitalizing on whatever mistake they make. So you're, you're actually being proactive and having them react. Well, I'll only talk about what I teach because what I teach is different than anybody else in that regard. I will create your mistakes. I won't, exactly. I won't yeah. I mean, give me one right off the bat. If you make one, okay, I'll take it. But no, I'm going to create, I'm going to create your mistakes. Um, and 
the biggest mistake is entangling with, with me to begin with. And that's how, it, that's how it would have to be with, you know, all my elite students. The biggest mistake was the other guy even messing with them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you have to put uh, a paramount on let's end this fight fast. Let's just, we can't play around here. Okay. This, we don't have all the time in the world to end this. It's got to happen quickly. And, you know, and it should, and it can, and, and it will. When you, when you look at uh, the human body and see all of their weaknesses, okay? And when you look at your body and know, I have so many different ways to attack this man, to hurt this man, to finish this man. It's just a matter of, of timing, not like 60 second timing, but timing, like getting the reaction that you need from the person to, to end it. And I'm not going to wait for you to do it. I'm going to create it. As you know, I, by, you know, subterfuge or you said pain, yeah, pain or just misdirection or, you know, it's all about control. You know, it, it, I become a control freak. I want to control you. I want to make you bend to my will. And I, you may not even be aware of it, you know, like a magician who does sleight of hand. And he uses misdirection. The, the spectators do not know they're being misdirected. If they were misdirected, if they knew it, then they wouldn't be misdirected. Okay? They'd be back on, on, on track. So I am going to make you, I'm going to misdirect you and mislead you. And you're never going to know it. And the next, next, next thing, it's all over. And you're like, shit, what happened there? Um, and again, to go back to the, the thing about BJJ or whatever, I, I'm sure there's other school, you know, different types of schools. I know, I know you're speaking in, in general terms, um, but I remember many years ago when I was start, you know, teaching out here uh, in Chicagoland, I called what I did the science of self-offense, not self-defense, not self-defense, self-offense. Um, because, I mean, it's, it's, it's a word salad, but it, it really was my philosophy on it. You know, once I'm engaging you, I'm going, I'm, I'm all in, okay? I'm not saying I'm going to kill you, but I'm, I'm all in. The fight will end when I say it ends, okay? Not when you tell me it's over. Okay, I quit. No, maybe I will. Maybe I will let you go. Maybe I won't, okay? Maybe it'll be over when I say it's over. And that's the bottom line. Total frigging control. And... That's how you have to be, Nico. Even if you don't have the skills, you know, ultimate skills, you should have enough to, to defend yourself. And, and if you can make your escape, as you mentioned earlier, okay, you chose to end the fight then. You engaged him enough till you could, till you could end the situation by perhaps leaving. Um, so it has to be all about you. It really does. Um, you have to have complete control over the whole shebang. Okay. This guy may have started your engine, but you got to drive the car. So it, it's on you. Now take over from, from this jerks uh, bullshit that he's trying to pull on you and, and, and take him out. Um, whatever that w would be. When I say take him out, I don't mean kill the guy necessarily. I'm just talking about ending the fight or making your escape, but do it on your terms. So let's lighten it up a little bit, <laughs> because unless you have something, well, you know. Not to, not to change the subject, but I'm curious, what kind of breathing exercises did Rod Von make you do? Uh, I guess, you know, I didn't know it about at that time. I would assume they're yogic based, based on yoga. But I had shown this, I don't know if I did it on video, but I know I showed some people this, breathing in like different kind of positions, standing on my head um, with like a, arching over a chair, just curled up on my back with my legs real tight up against my chest, having someone on me, having weight on my stomach and different areas, just breathing in um, very restricted ways. And then also just regular, you know, breathing up like this and flapping your arms down real hard to get your lung power going. Um, learning how to do shallow breathing, because like say when, when somebody's pinning you, 
Okay, let's say the guy, well, it doesn't matter how much the person weighs, but they're on your chest. If you take deep breaths, you know, your chest has, you know, everything is moving. Well, you're moving that guy's body weight, whatever the person weighs. Now, of course, you're not going to be, unless he's standing on you, you're not going to have his full body weight, but you're going to have a percentage of his body weight. So you're going to have to learn to breathe, sh you know, more shallow. So your chest is not attempting to exert any muscular motion to like lift him up and bring him down, lift him up and bring him down. You want very shallow breathing. So you need to learn how to do that as well. Um, so there were a variety of, of, of different types of, of, of breathing exercises. Uh, I never put a number to it, but you know, 15, 20 or whatever, but for those people listening or watching or whatever, um, you know, start learning to breathe in, in really different positions, bent over, you know, um, take a, take a belt, you know, get, a, go to the store, get an oversized belt, a belt that's too big for you or get a weightlifting belt or something and strap it along your stomach. So it's restricting you and learn how to breathe there, you know, and then bend over and do the different positions. So that's a way of adding even more resistance. The key is progressive resistance in anything, um, uh, you know, physical, uh, you know, lifting weights or whatever you want to make things as your body adapts, you want to make it harder and harder and harder for yourself. So these are things that you need to do. Um, <clears throat> and then ultimately, you'll find that no matter where you're at, unless the guy is literally smothering your mouth and your nose where you're not getting any air, uh, you won't panic that much about, you know, breathing. Uh, but you, the breath <clears throat> in a fight, two big important factors are your breath, or even in a match, even in a sport match, is your breath and your blood, okay? You cannot allow the guy to restrict your breathing, you know, by like, you know, doing something like this somehow with his hand, with his body, whatever, or, you know, blood choke you, you know, or again, strangle you here, you know, and uh, cut your wind supply out, you know, um, or choke you, you know, you just can't. So, you, you know, when you realize that, hey, I'm a, I'm a pretty good guy, I'm in pretty good shape, I can pretty, hand, pretty much handle anything, you have to treat, treat your, your air supply and your blood supply like it's Fort Knox, you know, you have to make sure that because once, once that's taken from you, it's all over. You're done. There's no coming back from that. Uh, that's really important. And then the other thing too, now that we're getting back into the street fight again, um, is your consciousness. Obviously, you, you want to protect your head, you know, so you don't get knocked out. And, um, if there's a, well, since we're talking about it, and again, we're back on the street fight. If there's a knife, you obviously do not want arteries, femoral arteries, carotid arteries, jugular vein, anything like that, where now that's a serious chance of bleeding out. This is no longer just a flesh wound that's, you know, you're losing X amount of blood. Um, you do not want your arteries cut. Uh, so these are things that you just have to, um, you know, guard for and, getting back to that reaction action thing. Um, I don't want to react, especially, especially if you have a weapon. Um, cause ultimately, you know, you can, you can, you can get me, you can stick me, you can, you can, you can cut me bad. So it's paramount now that I end this damn thing, you know, with the, this encounter, but, um, there's so many people probably in the world that never have actually even taken a deep breath. Or, or it's been many years since they've, they've filled their lungs with great air, clean air and breathe deeply and so on. It's not an elixir. You know, it's not going to solve all your problems and instantly double you and triple your strength or endurance or stamina. But, you know, it's certainly a good way of living. Another thing I used to do is hold my breath and I would time myself. <clears throat> Excuse me. I would time myself for how long I could hold my breath, um, which was great. And then you got to do some anaerobic stuff like wrestling, you know, and start holding your breath and seeing what activities you can do. Now you've got to be careful. If you have any kind of health issues, blood pressure problems or this or that, you got to watch, you got to get yourself checked out because a lot of instructors won't tell you this. They'll just say, do all this, do that, blah, blah, blah. Well, you, you, you have to make sure that you're okay. And, and we're living in a great era now where you can get like blood pressure cups, you know, at the, or cuffs, whatever they're called at, um, Walgreens or some drugstore and monitor your blood pressure, see what it's like after 
heavy exertion, uh, just see where you're at. You know, all of a sudden, if your blood pressure is 250 over, you know, 180 after doing something, you got an issue. You have a problem that you need to have that thing checked. So um, this, is a, this is a lot of, on people, on you to do, you know, but if, if you want to know where you're at in life and you want to know just how much your body is capable of doing, um, these are simple and inexpensive ways of doing it. What's a blood pressure monitor cost? And that can't be that much, 50 bucks. I mean, I, I have one, but I don't remember how much it costs. So, um, yeah, these are, you know, it's more than just listening to somebody tell you, do it. You know, I, I am a firm believer that people need to have uh, the science behind it and get yourself examined by a competent medical professional, get a clean bill of health, or, is, you know, or at least not even a clean bill of health, get a bill of health, know where you're at, where you stand, and, and try to make, uh, you know, make your improvements uh, first and foremost to your, to your anything critical in your health system, and then you know, it, you'll get benefits later. So, um, yeah, that's just, that's just how I feel. How your, your health has got to be number one. So when you were doing some of the restricted breathing exercises, um, did you do, did you actually have like someone sitting on your chest and you were trying to breathe? I did. I did at home. You know, I had my grandparents who would do that, you know. Um, and were you breathing like just shallow breaths and were you trying to hold your breath or was there some kind of a tempo or you just trying yeah. to relax yeah. and breathe? I didn't, I mean, there, no, there's no point in holding my breath. I, I didn't hold it there. I, I, I tried my shallow breathing. And at first, first of all, I did it with no one, you know, just, I learned how to shallow breathe. And I wanted to make sure, you know, um, you, you got to watch, so you don't hyperventilate, but there's, there's ways around it. You know, you just got to practice, you know, and then, um, then, yeah, then I used them. And then later when I started to be able to get, you know, some money when I was a young kid doing side jobs, and I bought a weight set. So I started stacking weight on my chest and on my stomach, you know, um, in different, you know, different positions uh, or not positions, but, you know, low on my stomach, middle stomach, by the xiphoid process, then up here, you know, just the best I could. And, um, and that helped. And, and that's kind of good because, again, if you're, let's say, a 200-pound man on top of you, you're not, unless he's standing on you, you're not going to carry his whole 200 pounds. You know, you may, whatever the percentage is, you know, it depends on how he's pinning you. <laughs> a lot of guys love to just stay on their knees and literally you're not carrying any of their weight. They're doing you such a favor, but you don't want to, you don't want to train like that. You want to train like this guy really knows what he's doing and he's, he's trying to crush you and then do it when you pull your neck up oh, like that, you know, so you're, you're kind of almost like restricting yourself. And then um, you just want to handicap yourself as much as you can. And, and you're going to know, you're going to learn, okay, it's going to, I can do this. I can hold, I can withstand this for 30 seconds, or I can withstand, withstand this for 30 minutes. There's no more mystery. Okay. You're not freaking out. You're, you're not wondering in the, in the heat of battle, how long can I put up with this? You know, um, you need to have all those questions answered before you start engaging. And if you have a training partner, make him hold you down. Make him hold you down like my head and arm on the lost art of hook, hooking, for example. And it's going to benefit him and you because he's going to find out just how long he can hold you down because he's going to get tuckered out maybe. And you're going to learn how, how, you can, how long you can hold. Don't try to escape. Don't even, don't even go there. This, this, this exercise is to, to learn to breathe, learn to relax in that regard, but just time yourself and then keep on trying to improve. Um, these are just simple things that to me are simple, at least um, that can really augment your training and, and take you to a, a different level, you know? So um, cost nothing or next to nothing to do. So money should not be an issue. And even if it was, can you put a price tag on saving maybe not your life if if you but your your friends and family and loved ones 
you know, how much is it willing, like, like training costs money to train. It's worth, it's, it should be an investment. It should be money that, that pays off in the end. So um, th this is all stuff that you need to do. And yeah, I think, I think that could really give you a mental edge when, when, especially like if you know your conditioning is great and you know, you can sit under, you know, a 200 pound person on your chest and still be fine for a period of time. I think that can make a big difference in your, um, like a mental edge. You, you're just, you're just not afraid of losing your breath, which is probably the number one thing that uh, I would say throws people off mentally is when they start getting out of breath. Oh, not <laughs> mentally, but you know, physiologically it weakens you that, you know, uh, uh, who was it? Uh, was it, uh, uh, Vince Lombardi that said, you know, I think it was him fatigue makes cowards of us all. And that's very, very true. Um, and none of us, no human being that's ever lived can be in their peak throughout their whole life unless they instantly get killed after, you know, once they hit their peak. Um, you will deteriorate. But you don't have to necessarily be in your greatest shape. Take any, let's, 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 let's talk boxing a minute. Take any champion fighter. Do we know for sure do they know for sure that they were in the best shape they could be to win? Let's take a champion. Any, any guy who, any weight division that won the championship, how do we truly know that they were in their best condition? You don't. You're, you're, you're speculating that they were, and obviously they were, they were in good enough condition to win the championship, but you don't know if they were in their best condition. What ends up happening as you get older is your lungs kind of become decayed. Your legs seem to go. Um, that's for sure. Uh, and you're not going to, the fight you're never going to win is against father time, but you can still be as, uh, relatively percentage wise, as good at 40 as you were at 20 and at 60, as you were at 40 and at 80, as you were at 60 percentage wise, you know, meaning What's the maximum ability I could have as a 20 year old? And if you're in 80 to 90% of that, that's great. Same with the 40, 60, 80 year old. You know, what, what's the maximum that I could be? And you want to, you want to be as close to your maximum ability as you can. And trust me, not everybody out there is a world-class athlete. And if you do make the commitment to stay in shape, like Kevin, that got killed at 70, he was stronger than pretty much 80 to 85 percent of 20 year olds 20 people in their 20s okay you know think about that so you, you he wasn't stronger than world-class power lifters in their 20s and 30s or whatever but he was in his age group he was but overall you know how how good are you and that that's really plays a, a key in self-defense because you're not going up against let's say Mike Tyson in his peak or, you know, the world's greatest MMA guy in their peak in a street fight, you're going up against probably someone who may have had some training um, and who, who may be a professional criminal, but you might be far better in shape. Even if you are 20, 30 years older than the guy, uh, this is something that I try to tell people to, who, who always ask me, is it too old to train? No. It's never too old to train. What are your alternatives? You have one alternative, and that's not training. So you know you're not going to get any better. Now, if you're going to tell me, Tony, I'm 60 years old, and I want to win the UFC. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. You're not going to do it, okay? <laughs> but can you get tough at 60 or whatever age? Absolutely. And even if you have physical disabilities that limit you, you can develop your mind. And if you care about humanity – if you could develop your mind and learn all the techniques that I know, and then you can reach people in your circle, 10, 20, 30 people, who knows, as a coach, well, you've just, you know, and then it's just, you know, powers of multiplication. All of a sudden, they're going to train people and so on. Now you've reached a large population and everybody's happy. So the only reason you shouldn't train is that you just don't have the desire to want to do it. 
okay? If there's even a shred of desire, go for it. And you'll know soon enough what your limitations are if you have the proper coach, you know, who isn't uh, whitewashing you, you know, and playing a, playing a game with you. So it, this, that's just my, my, my take on it. I mean, be, I've seen too many you know, people just waste their, their ability. Money you can always get back. Time you cannot. And I've seen a lot of people waste it. Um, well, you know, so we've talked a lot today about that kind of stuff, and we still have to keep going here because we got to wait for Joe to get back. Um, I think he forgot. I am back. Oh. Oh, we, wow. Oh, my God. That's frightening. Um, no, Joe, so now that you're here, I'm glad you're here. Yeah, what did I miss? Can you just uh, start from the beginning? Well, see, there were, <laughs> there was these two twins. They were blondes. Anyway. Um, you know so, those guys. Yeah, you would. <laughs> um, you wanted some questions about pool, me shooting pool or whatever you were talking on. Well, yeah, with you, with pool, there's a lot to do. Since we've, got the, since we've introduced the game room now to the mix, I think we can talk a little bit. Well, how did, how did you – let's talk about your history. What first got you into pool? Oh, okay. So long story. So when I was really, really young, we're talking like single digits here, eight, nine years old, something like that. Well, I was, everybody knows I was raised with my grandparents, but my mom got remarried and once in a blue moon, I would spend the weekend with them. Not often, but I would. And they would, my stepdad was from Kentucky and he liked to shoot pool. So anyway, he, I would go out and, you know, at the bars or whatever as a kid. And then I would see that there was this guy, he was built like a jockey. He was really small, maybe 5'1", 5'2", 100 pounds, something like that. His name was Tommy Sanders from Kentucky, but this was in Cleveland. And he was just a phenomenal pool player. To this day, he was the best bar pool player I'd ever seen. And uh, with the, back then, they had the oversized cue balls. So I just, I don't know, just loved the game. And then I, I saw the movie The Hustler. With, I got one of the posters up there I made, um, and uh, Paul Newman and uh, Jackie Gleason. And it was just something that I wanted to do. So uh, um, I remember I got a little toy. I, I was cutting grass and stuff. And I, I made a few dollars through the summer. And I bought this little toy, like three foot by foot and a half or whatever. A little like marble size balls, you know. And I wanted to practice that. And then they would have wide, wide world of sports. They had Howard Cosell and they had... Minnesota Fats versus Willie Moscone. I was watching all of that stuff, and I just took to it. And then when I got out of high school, I bought a pool table, and I was playing pretty good pool by then. And then, um, you know, it just was one of those things. So I, I love the game. Uh, and as I mentioned on some other podcasts, I used to shoot pool in bars, not necessarily pool halls, because back then I wanted to meet girls as well. You're not going to meet any in the pool hall. So because of pool – and we don't probably have the time to get into it today, but I've seen a lot of encounters that turned that some of them I was involved in, but just witnessing others, um, how things can take a violent turn. And as a matter of fact, a lot of bars ended up uh, through the years, just removing the pool table because just too many arguments and fights over the game. You know, my, that's my quarter. I got the next game or whatever. Just, you didn't call that shot and da, 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 da. So, um, but it's a, it's a game that through the years and I lost, I didn't play for many years. Um, you know, life gets in the way. You know, you can't be the, you know, jack of all trades, master of none thing. I don't want that. So, you know, I, I wanted to master certain things. And I had a lot on my plate. You know, I was fighting things and then music, drums, accordion, pool, you know, and then whatever. Um, those were probably, you know, the big um, passions in my life. I mean, Sports always, you know, I was a sprinter, but that was just, that's a subset. Um, but then, you know, hobbies, you have, everybody has hobbies like, you know, electronics I had or, or hot rods. That's okay. But yeah, I wanted to be, um, you know, fast. I wanted to be strong, tough, and shoot good pool and play good music. Um, they said in the, one of the most talented human beings of the 20th century was actually Ted Williams, the baseball player, because Ted Williams was world class in three completely uh, distinctive things. He was perhaps the greatest hitter in baseball, at least that hit in it of all, perhaps of all time, but definitely he was the greatest hitter in baseball during his time. 
He was also one of the world's greatest fishermen. People don't know this. He won fishing things. And he was one of the world's greatest pilots. He had reflexes and hand-eye coordination that was astounding during World War II and the Korean War. So he may not have been number one, but he was way up there in three things that are completely unrelated to um, one another. So that is a, a really talented man. And uh, while I had no aspirations of, of Ted Williams, and I didn't even know these facts as a kid, that was kind of like my thing. I, I wanted to be great at, you know, a bunch of stuff. I mean, that's just how I am as a man. You know, if I'm going to get into it, I'm going to get into it all the way, or I'm just not even going to be interested. So pool. Yeah. I'll always love pool. I'll, I'll love the, I love to watch talented players play. Um, and I am astounded by the level of playing right now, but also I want to add to those who don't know about pool that much. The equipment has changed drastically through the years. The, the, Simona's cloth, uh, low deflection shafts, the composition of the balls, uh, everything has changed. The game in itself is easier than it's ever been. But conversely, it's tougher now because there's a lot of great players and they've taken it to a level that may be unmatched in history. That's it. <laughs> that, you know, that hair of yours, that's cool. It's going to keep growing too, man. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and stay committed during this COVID thing, man. <laughs> you should see Ben's hair. His hair is down to his shoulders. It's like the 1970s over here. So, and is that why you named him after a rat? Which rat are we referring to? Uh, ben was a rat. Oh, uh, yes, from the Willard trilogy of movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unrelated. My, my interest in uh, rodents are completely unrelated to him. Actually, I missed, uh, we, we realized I should have named him Obi-Wan Kenobi, but uh, that was a missed, missed opportunity. So if I ever have any kids late in life, which I won't, that'll be the next round. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's not a lot of women that are that desperate, Joe, let's face it. Well, it's, it's, just, it's just like fighting. It's all about deception, right, Tony? It's always... Keeping them guessing. We're going to call you the great deceiver. <laughs> Joe. De Mis <laughs> Misdirection. Yeah, right. <laughs> pain, pain compliance. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've been talking heavy, pretty much all about training, street fighting, breathing exercises, Joe. So you missed out on a bunch, but you can watch the, the, the podcast. Um, so, yeah, I just hope that the quality comes out. You know, my, I, I'm using that, uh, phone camera and it froze up on me, but I think, I mean, Nico's not saying that I'm frozen. My, my phone camera did for some reason or another, this old phone thing. I'll have to check that out. It's no big deal. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I am, I'm glad that you're still among the employed, both of you guys. That's good. I hope to be joining you guys shortly <laughs> soon. Um, but, um, so what else can I tell you is um, I do want to say, and then Nico may not have heard this, but I will hopefully be filming one technique uh, talk during the week now um, and upload it to Joe to YouTube and put a link on Facebook, just short, 10 minutes, something like that. Um, it's, it's good for me now because I have things set up and, uh, you know, for me, if things are a struggle, because I'm under a lot of, you know, I got a lot of things going on with my mom and just everything else. And it's kind of stressful. I need things kind of simple. So I have this little, I guess you want to call it a studio set up now. I believe I have everything I need. Nico, I know that you had a little trouble today with your uh, computer, but look, we were able to make it work. That's the good thing. Got to have like backup, backup plans. Um, so Joe, let me ask, let me ask you this. You lived in Chicago for many years, right? Oh, yeah. Grew up there. Born on the north side. And Nico's question was, when you live in a quote-unquote nice area, you know, how, how do you keep your uh, edge, you know? And you moved out of Chicago maybe 20 years ago. Um, how do you keep your edge of reality? I know you take the train in, so that kind of helps you a little bit. 
Well, it's, it's a good question because you can definitely very easily get lulled into kind of a, a false sense of security. And just um, for me, it is kind of, um, I mean, there are incidents, like you said, I've, I've run into some things on the train and on the street, even out here in the burbs where it's kind of a reminder. Um, but it is, to me, it's a, a, a deliberate mental discipline, you know, because a lot of times training is hard. Um, you know, like you said, in some ways you should dread your training a little bit. And so it's hard to get motivated, but um, just, I try and keep those, when I've had those incidents, I try and keep them fresh in my mind and revisit them and saying, hey, this could happen again. So uh, almost like using visualization or just trying to think about it, uh, being very deliberate. Yeah, this can happen. Or even just watching news for that matter. I mean, I mean, you're always getting the bad news of what's out there. And you remember, this could be, you know, what's going on. The other thing sometimes too is I'll, I'll I'll either be in a workout or whatever scenario, I'll see someone who looks kind of badass and I'll be like, okay, he's who I'm going to visualize when I shadow box or work the bag. This guy would be intimidating to have to go up against. Um, you know, I try and keep it sharp in my mind, um, trying to keep it real, you know. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's kind of, I think, part of the mental discipline. It's just like being aware. I, you know, I try to, I'm very introverted. So, um, by nature, I'm probably just always thinking about, I'm daydreaming and thinking off, and that's a very bad thing. So I have to be very deliberate about, okay, you know, am I seeing who's around me? You know, it's part of my ongoing, like, self-training, keeping my awareness. And the same thing with just keeping it real and kind of going through scenarios in my head. What would happen if, you know, this was dangerous, if they got within this close of me? So I think it's a lot of mental rehearsal for me. Um, uh, to tap into that, to try and remember how it felt to be intimidated or scared, you know. Uh, I think that that's, you know, a big part of it. I, I did, I've did. i listened in on some of your conversations, and I do agree that, you know, it isn't impressive when some people can just, you know, they, they've been under uh, stressful situations for so long, they just go into, into uh, you know, into motion right away, like you mentioned people in healthcare and, and, and protection and stuff, and that's definitely where you want to get to. Um, but no, it's a, it's a constant game, you know, and actually I was going to, on that note, I was going to, and this, uh, we don't have much time left, but maybe for next time, or maybe you can answer it shortly. Um, you know, when we train, we kind of train in a friendly environment and, and I wouldn't say it's easy, but definitely we, we trust each other because what we do is dangerous. I mean, we do, you know, neck cranks, leg locks, things that can, if you didn't trust your training partner, um, you know, could, could end your training for a while or leave you permanently messed up. But on the flip side, though, do you think it's valuable to kind of, even internally, like for me, um, to try and force yourself to kind of train angry a little bit? Or to, do you think there's a value to, like you talked about flipping the switch. So like if I'm in a role, I may not have to advertise it, but just, you know, try and get yourself worked up a little bit, artificially even, just to kind of be in the habit of, okay, if I'm in a fight now, I need to, I'm not going to be reckless and hurt my training partner, but I still need to have, make sure I'm in the right mental state of mind, which to me, I think there should be a level of aggression. I don't know if you agree with that or what your thoughts are on that. Well, every time I see you, I get angry. So I do yeah. understand that. Um, no, it, 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 I can't answer it shortly. We should discuss this next week or whenever, because yeah, you, you, you want everything you just mentioned. However, you're, you're still playing a game. You're still, it's fake. You can't just pretend you're angry. You, 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 you can't. You, it has to be triggered in you. So instead of the anger, to me, it's about the adrenaline. You have got to get the adrenaline going. And that is where the coach comes in, or at least, me in my way of thinking that's where i come in okay and if you can remember many years ago back at the tool and die shop um you guys probably weren't really concerned well you weren't there that long but most guys weren't really weren't concerned about each other they were more afraid of me because i'd go off on you you know that and that kind of scared people okay and kind of like oh man shit if i don't do this i mean tony's going to go off he's going to snap what's what's going to happen here and that was purposeful, okay, because that is what created the, that was the fuel for the engine. And if your opponent, your training partner, I should say, you know that they're not going to hurt you. There's got to be something in your training that, forget about the hurt part, 
but that's going to trigger that adrenaline. You know, um, maybe it could be that I tell you, you're done. I'm not teaching you anymore. You don't have it. Get out. Don't come back. Okay. Whatever. Okay. Um, and I do that on an individual basis. Once I get to know you, uh, and I know your strengths and your weaknesses. So we can, we can discuss this more in depth another time. Cause I know we're getting, we're getting cut short here. Um, but before we wrap it up here, let me just add that, you know, I do appreciate both of you guys, especially like today, Nico, you were going through some technical issues and you did not let that derail you. You did not quit. You, you wanted to, uh, be on this podcast. And that's part of why you will be a success in whatever you choose to do, because it's very easy to say, I can't do it. Um, and sometimes you just can't, we get it, but you did not let this uh, stand in your way. And thanks to Joe, he was able to work with you apparently and get, get this thing all geared up. And Joe was an epitome today of a support group. You know, we were a team. You know, I really couldn't help you, Nico, but Joe could. And that's, this is what everybody needs. They need a little community to uh, be selfish, self, selfless, and, and, and look for the betterment of all. Because if you have a training group, people out there, if one guy excels, then he's going to bring you up with him. Okay, if you keep him down, then you're all going to go down in the toilet. So it's, it's, it's a joint venture. And yeah, I'm very appreciative of you guys. Uh, if I don't always say it, I want you guys to know it. So thanks again for being here this week. And, um, you know, that's it. Thanks. Thank Coach. you guys. Great to be Thank you part. guys for all the insights. Yep. Yeah, good questions. And I look forward to seeing everybody. Um, yeah, you know, next week. All right. right. Bye, everybody. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye.